Welcome back, everybody. SF Live number or episode number 80 already. Time is flying, and uh, I'm joined by a very special guest yet again today. Uh, it's Mr. Phil Baker. He's the president and CEO of Hecla Mining. But before we switch over to, uh, to Phil and uh, talk about Hecla, Please be reminded to use hashtag AskHL, that's the company's ticker, for your questions here on Twitter. We'll make sure to check those while we're having our conversation with Phil. Also, make sure to follow us on Twitter and YouTube, subscribe to our channels, and uh, leave some comments and uh, hit the alert button. That way you get notified when we go live. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Phil Baker. Phil, uh, you're traveling. You're obviously uh, in a hotel room right now, and uh, I hope everything's going well. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. And uh, I just noticed I'm not getting any sound in from you for some reason. Let me just double check that real quick um, while we're live. So just want to make sure that everybody can hear you. And uh, let's see if that works. There so we go. one, two, three. Do you we got you. Sorry about okay. that. So, um, yeah. So just welcome back on the show. It's really great that you're joining us. And um, it's great to get an update because last time we spoke, the Q2 numbers were not out. So much has happened since. And there's so much. And we just talked about it offline as well, like to talk about um, that has happened. Um, trying to find a good point to where to start. Like I like starting maybe with the financials, uh, the Q2 financials. Maybe you give us some highlight numbers and we can dive just a little deeper there. Well, look, the, the second quarter was very much as expected. Um, you know, if you if you think about Hecla for the past uh year we and at the end of q2 of 2019 there was a lot of consternation in the marketplace as to you know where we were and what was uh, what we were going to be doing and we you know came out and said okay here's the amount of free cash flow that we would anticipate generating over the second half of the year and uh, there were some people that doubted and uh, we went on and, and, and performed as we had, had announced we would, same thing um, in the first half of this year. So, so what we saw in the second quarter is what we expected. Um, we have had the good fortune of having even better metal prices than what we had had in, you know, prior to, to that. Uh, and we've now seen that in the third quarter it going up even even higher. And as a result of that, the balance sheet of the company has improved dramatically. Uh, you know, we uh, we had drawn down on the revolver uh, and in, in, in to, as a as a safety measure with uh, with COVID, and uh, we've now repaid uh, 150 of the 200 million. You'll have the last bit repaid before the uh, end of the year or, or sooner um, and uh, so we're in very good shape no definitely and the silver prices and the, even the gold price jump really really helped improve economics uh, you, you mentioned the credit revolver you you took that out back in uh, uh, late January if I remember correctly to sort of protect yourself from any COVID fallout and you repaid that early so um, before we dive deeper into the financial I'm really curious like what your stance on that is like you took it out as a precaution now you're paying it back um, other countries are locking down and I don't want to stay on COVID too long but uh, what, what's your stance? What's like what your advisors tell you as well in terms of like what, what's likely to happen maybe in the US and Canada uh, in the fall or in the winter if we do see a resurgence of cases? Well, it's unlikely that we'll see a lockdown. I, I think, uh, you know, we've demonstrated the mining industry and Hecla in particular has demonstrated our ability to deal with uh, the COVID cases. You know, I, across the company, across three jurisdictions, we've had uh, a couple of cases. We haven't had very many, and we have dealt with those cases and have not had to shut down any operations. So I wouldn't anticipate any sort of shutdown. Um, the other thing that's happened is our financial position has strengthened so much that we're able to repay the revolver and put cash on the balance sheet from free cash flow. And so just as we've done over the last decade, if you go and you look at our, our balance sheet over the last decade, we've had... Um, Cash on the balance sheet. We've not revol re re uh, re we've not relied upon the revolver, and that's back to where we're going. Is no need to rely on the revolver. And so, if there if there is any turmoil that happens as a result of uh, COVID, I mean, we're we're prepared to deal with it. 
Okay. And now, since we're on the topic of COVID, I just want to talk about quickly how the COVID protocols that you've added are sort of affecting your revenue streams. I'm looking at uh, all in sustaining costs on a per ounce basis because I know you're quarantining, for example, still up at Greens Creek, um, your, your, your workers that add some cost. Um, can you talk to, to the economics of that to us for a second? Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it is not a major impact to us. Um, in an in an aggregate basis, it's it's less than a dollar per ounce impact to us, uh, and so the the silver price has risen dramatically more than the cost of dealing with COVID. Having said that, we are looking at how do we test more rapidly. Uh, you know, it's I'm I'm always surprised when I hear about these organizations that you know have this sort of immediate sort of testing. You know, in Juneau, Alaska, we don't have that. Um, in Juneau, in fact, when we take a test, it then gets shipped to the lower 48 and gets processed. So we've got a couple of day delay. So we're working on how do we get that rapid testing into Juneau. We, uh, we have some, um, we're, we're, we're advancing some ideas. We think we'll be able to get that in place in the next month or so, um, which if, if we're successful, then you'll see a shorten that, uh, that, quarantine period, which would lower some of those costs. Okay. Um, while we're talking about costs and all that, or not just cost related, but the debt notes and credit revolver and all the financial financial, financial tools that you have available, um, the Quebec funds are, Ivetesimont Quebec, I'm still trying to learn that word. Um, I had French five years in school, I'm still struggling with it. Um, you invested $50, $50 million, they gave you $50 million for an unsecured note. Um, with a 5.74% interest, which is really interesting. It's nice and low, um, but it came with a couple of covenants and the way you have to spend that money. Maybe you can give us some more color on that and how you plan to use those proceeds. Yeah, we're, the, the obligation we have is over the course of four years is to spend about $100 million Canadian, um, which we will do as a, as a matter of course. That's our plan. Um, there's no change there. It'll be both development of the underground and and layback of the pits and uh, equipment purchases that we would do in in uh, in any case. So uh, we were quite willing to to do that to give them comfort that yes, there would be reinvestment made in Quebec, and we have every intention of doing that. So great alignment between us and Investment Quebec. In addition to to that, we have the ability to use some of those proceeds for the, uh, the the purchase of the bonds that we we issued earlier in the year the uh, we had hoped that investment quebec could have been part of that offering we weren't able to get the timing right where it could work for them um, so that was the idea was maybe to take some of those proceeds and reduce that um, however the bonds have traded so well that they're expensive to buy back so we won't uh, we won't do that until we see the bonds trade down and you know who knows when that might occur okay so i was going to ask you actually as a follow-up sort of uh, do, how, how much of the 50 million have you earmarked for for re, uh, or buying back those bonds but it seems yeah, like it's don't. still in flux so yeah yeah it's there's no obligation to do that that was just something that we thought we would do um because we really don't need that amount of indebtedness but um you know we'll we'll uh, put it to good work no, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, so while we're on the topic of financials, like one thing I've noticed uh, in the last few months, and unfortunately, Robinhood shut off their tracker. Um, I wanted to talk about that quickly as well, uh, since I have you on as a, as a major mining company. Um, how, what was the impact for you? Like I've seen like your amount of shareholders, Robinhood holders has increased from like 3000 in early, I think the table says early June or so to over 24,000 shareholders that are, hold shares in their Robinhood accounts. How is that impacting you? Like, I know you're not probably not involved in the day-to-day -day IR, but I'm curious what kind of sort of boils up to your, uh, to, to you in, da in daily conversation. So, so, so the reality is Hecla is a very retail shareholder friendly company and have been, has been for a hundred years. So it's no surprise that you have these investors going in on Robinhood and investing in Hecla. Um, and we welcome them. We have 74,000 shareholders. Um, we, um, we, we have a great relationship with our retail shareholders. We try to do things that give those shareholders an opportunity to interact with, uh, with the management of the company. Uh, and we've got new ideas coming up all the time. So stay tuned for that. Cause I think you'll see some of those come out in the next month or two. Cool. Yeah. I've seen your investor web conferences that where you invite uh, investors to 
to sort of book 30 minute meetings with you as well uh, i think that's a great initiative to be accessible there as well um yeah i'm just curious like robin hood is such a phenon- phen- phenomenon that uh, even one of the comments we received on our uh, interview that we did may 27th on youtube was oh the uh, hecla was one of the free shares i got on he- uh, on robin hood right so I don't, but, I don't you know, even know it, how it, it works. So. But it's interesting. But it's interesting <laughs> if you if you go back and you look at a number of the you know you had you had Charles Schwab years ago. We became a, you know traded a number of shares through Charles Schwab when they were were having their growth. Um, it's you know we're just a known commodity for precious metals in the retail market. Yeah, that's actually a very good point because that's something you pointed out in a recent presentation at a at an analyst event as well. Uh, I think it was the HC Wainwright event that uh, Hecla is actually a household name. You've been around for, uh, you you got to give me the exact number. 120, 129 years. Next year yeah. will be one hundred and thirty. That's crazy, right? So you're one of the oldest mining companies. You are uh, publicly listed the, anyway, the, but. Uh, the. The, the oldest, oldest mining company, yeah. So there is some household recognition. I have to admit, like back in the day, I was always like afraid, like the big heckler. And now we're having this conversation, right? It's because it has that household reputation. So um, I'm a bit of a, well, a small we've, fan. We've boy, always maybe. been, we've always been small, but we're we're hoping to get bigger. So <laughs> no, fantastic. You're over three billion market cap Canadian right now. So going the, trending the right US, way because US, US. Oh, sorry. Yes, I've been looking stock watch. I always use it for Canada. That's why. No, it's three billion US. You're right. Um, because the last interview we did, you were at three dollars fifteen. Now we're at five seventy eight. So you're welcome for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, we also need to talk about the silver link dividend. I find that's really interesting. That's something you've recently announced. Um, so to, to show yep. how well you're doing, uh, give us some more details on that. I find that really interesting. So so l- let me give you a little bit of a background as to why we felt like we could in- enhance the dividend policy and realize we did two things. We increased the base dividend 50% and we lowered the trigger for the silver link dividend. So we've been paying a dividend consistently since 2011 you know, so sort of through all the ups and downs that you've had over the, that nine-year time frame. Um, and so we uh, we saw the opportunity to enhance it because of the free cash flow that we're generating. So if you, th- if you look at our guidance that we give and you annualize that guidance and you use the current metals price on an annualized basis, you've got a company that generates, call it $175 million of free cash flow. So with that, we can enhance these dividends. So my expectation is if if in the month of September, we realize $25 for our silver uh, silver sales, then you'll see us with the silver link dividend in this this quarter. Uh, one thing is like I saw the, the how do you call the level? So let's call it 25, 30, 35. Let, let's say it trades at 27.50. What, how does that affect? Is it just a $25 yeah, level, 30 a, level? So Correct, correct. Okay. So it, so, so the, it, once it hits 25, there's a payout for the shareholders, um, but it doesn't, there isn't an additional payout until it hits 30. Okay. But realize that before it, you had to get to 30 just to get the silver link at, at all. No, I, mean, I think you made an interesting comment in one of the press releases as well that as, if it were today, I think you'd see three, three and a half times the dividend that you've seen before. That's a 350% increase. Like, that's who, correct. You can say that, right? So that's a, uh, that that's was an exactly interesting right. comment. So um, last financial question before we dive more into the projects. Like I've seen one very interesting, like going through your MDNA, there's one thing that jumped out at me and that was a $14 million loss on base metal derivatives in the second quarter. Maybe you can elaborate on that one as it jumped out to me like that. Sure. So, so... Um, we have consistently um, hedged our base metals since 2009. <clears throat> and the thought behind that um, was um, that we want to have some assurance of what our free cash flow will be looking forward. So we hedge out a year to two years and we we do it on a consistent basis. And as prices decline, we often will then cash out that that hedge position. So <laughs> the fact that prices have gone up is okay because what it means is we're putting new positions on at a higher price and putting even more. So we have a sort of a scaled up program that's kind of dependent upon the metals price. So I'm I'm quite happy when we start to lose money on those derivative positions because it means we're hedging at higher prices. And you've certainly seen that for the, the lead and the zinc markets. Okay, gotcha. And that okay. represents that represents about 20% of our revenues is the base metals. Okay. 
No, that makes sense. Okay, appreciate that. Thanks for clarifying that. And um, sort of to, to segue over, is like I want to talk about the silver price assumptions that you're using. You're still running with 1450. And I know we had that conversation back in back in May as well about your assumptions. Now that we've seen like four months of higher prices, what, what's the investment community telling you to use? Like I'm sure there's a couple investors or bigger ones that might want to see you increase your resources and reserves based on price updates. There's, um, no, nah, we, we, we will unlikely change our silver price assumption in calculating. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Let me grab some water. <clears throat> yeah, no worries. <laughs> <coughs> we'll likely <clears throat> leave those assumptions alone um, <clears throat> because these, these ore bodies very high grade, very defined boundaries. So we don't get a lot of benefit from a higher price. We have lots of margin. So that's the thing to realize. When you think about our business, at 1450, all of our ounces are going to be. Are, can you still hear me? Yeah. I, are you, yeah. OK. At, for, at 1450, all of our ounces are going to have margin. When you look at our peers, it's some higher number. For the most part, it's seventeen dollars before they uh, where, where they they reach a point where their ounces have margin. No, no I've seen quite a few studies lately where companies use higher <coughs> silver and gold prices. For that matter, I think the highest I've seen lately was sixteen fifty in a PEA assumption for gold, and uh, just just it means you can increase your resources and reserves, and you can hide, uh, mine a lower grade material. Right. So, but yeah, but it so you're extending your mine life. You're making the resource bigger. Um, but you're lowering the margin, you're lowering the cash flow generation from the mines. And, you know, that was a path that the industry went down in 2011, 12, 13, and it ended in tears, right? You had all of these companies that, that had to take huge write-offs, billions and billions of dollars. Heckler's write-offs have been zero. We have not had to write anything off uh, in the past uh, 10 years. So, um, we're, we'll probably stay with this uh, this approach. There might be some adjustments that we'll make maybe on the gold side, but I'm not anticipating much on the silver side. Okay, yeah, since, since we're let's follow this line of thought for a second, because um, last year we've seen the mega mergers and we haven't seen anything come out of them really. Everybody expected maybe some asset sales or so. Um, is that higher gold price maybe affecting that that they're making actually now money off of those projects and uh, they actually were able to re recalculate some of the resources and reserves and make it economic? Um, yeah, you know, I'm sure that's that enters into it. The other uh, other thing that 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 happens is um, until you sort of reach a place where there's a sense that there's a plateau, there's a a great reluctance to enter into a trade because people are afraid they're at the at the you know they're selling at the wrong time. No, no, it makes sense. Um, let, let's talk about the projects for a second. And uh, let, let's start. I, I don't know. I have a hard time starting. Let's start in the south. Let's start further south. Let's start with San Sebastian in Mexico. Um, back in back in May, we had that conversation. And you, you said that there's a likelihood or there's a chance that the production might be extended by five to seven years. Now, in the recent MDNAs or in the recent financials, you said that might actually not happen. Um, like, wh where are we on this? Like so, so, yeah. So remember what we were doing was a test of the sulfide materials something called the hue zone. And we have, um, we had this, this upper portion of the hue zone um, that we, uh, we tested. And what we what we found is that part is not economic. And, and so in order to get to the economic part of the ore body, there's a big capital investment that we have to make. And the payback on that capital investment is about a th three to four years of that five to seven year mine life. And we've just said, okay, that's too high of a risk to make that investment. So we're 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 putting that on pause. We're continuing to do the exploration. We'll mine out what's what we have uh, identified, and we'll just continue the exploration um, there. So, you know, no, we we're 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 not we're not disappointed. You know, we 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 think this is a great asset, but it's time is not right to make that sort of investment. Gotcha. Is there any like in terms of exploration since we're on on San Sebastian around it? Besides directly on the asset, are there any assets nearby? Like, what's what's the growth strategy in that regard? Like, well, remember it's a 27 square mile land package. So, so it's within our land package that we have exploration targets that are to the south of where we've been mining. You know, we've been doing this um, 
this reverse circulation drilling where we've take, gone through the overburden, which is 30 meters or so um, deep, and we've been hitting the bedrock, and we, uh, we've been identifying new veins that are mineralized. Now, at this point, we haven't um, made a new discovery of an economic mineralization, but give us time. It's, uh, it looks sure. very, very intriguing. Okay, so San Sebastian will be on care and maintenance come Q1 2021. Is that what we're looking um, at? It will be. We'll be done with the mining and the and the the mill processing. Uh, done with mining this quarter. Done with the mill processing in the fourth quarter. Um, and care and maintenance is too strong of a term. We'll be back in the exploration mode because remember we've we've out of the last what uh, almost 20 years we've mined it for about 10. We've explored it for about about 10. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's briefly talk about Nevada. Uh, let's, let's get the negatives out of the way before we get to the positive projects. Um, you, you were working on, you said you do a collaboration with Nevada Gold Mines on the bulk sample. Um, I haven't, I couldn't find an update. I might have missed it, but uh, I couldn't find an update. Well, there isn't, the there, isn't an up, there isn't an update yet because we haven't delivered the, the ore to them. We've, uh, we've put at surface about half the ore that we need to deliver. We're going to deliver 30,000 tons. Uh, and you'll see that happen early in the fourth quarter. And then we'll get the results of that late in the fourth quarter, early in the first quarter of next year. And so we'll see where we are. Uh, you know, in the meantime, we're continuing to develop for that, for the access to that um, uh, sulfide mineralization. We've stopped mining separately oxide mineralization. Because uh, remember, we would we were only going to mine what was already developed, so we're not doing any new development for uh, for oxide mineralization, and we'll see where we end up there. Um, and when you say bad news, the only bad news is it didn't achieve what we were hoping for it to achieve in the short term, which was Fire Creek generating this free cash flow. You know, the good news is we accepted that it wouldn't be able to do that, and now we're doing the exploration on Midas. Um, on Hollister and on Fire Creek, uh, we'll be starting that. Midas is underway as we speak. We'll be doing more on Hollister and Fire Creek over uh, over the coming year. No, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, I just wanted to get that out because I want to talk about Casa Berardi, Lucky Friday. Uh, that's ramping up, especially towards 100% production this year. Um, Casa Berardi, we touched on already, and we, we're a bit running out of time. <laughs> it's always fun to talk to a producer. There's so many aspects we can talk about. Uh, but let's talk about Lucky Friday real quick and the the ramp up. And uh, what's the status there? How are we looking? So the, the ramp up's going extraordinarily well, and we'll be in full production um, in the fourth quarter. Uh, and what that means is that we go from 750,000 ounces of silver production last year to 1.5 this year. And then we're in in position to have three million ounces next year, and then from there it continues to increase to five million ounces over the course of four years. So it's just a continued growth uh, of of the production from the Lucky Friday. Costs are are very stable. Um, we have a three year contract with the union. We have all of this infrastructure that's in place. Um, so very little capital outlays um, required. Fantastic. So I have one last question. It, it, it's it, in regard to growth. Obviously, Lucky Friday is ranking, ramping up. Casa Berardi, you're increasing throughput as well and reliability. But is there any external growth that you foresee? Like um, you, you have quite a few exploration projects and uh, in your portfolio. Is there anything like organic growth within the company, or is like wh where is where's growth coming from? Your mining company dividends are nice, but I'm sure the market wants to see a reinvestment of some of the dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. Right we'll now. continue. We'll continue to reinvest, and and so you're going to have growth. Number one at the Lucky Friday, on top of what we're talking about is that I've already talked about is the idea of trying to increase the throughput. Um, so we're looking at two different ways of doing that. And if we're successful with that, we you could see the throughput increase about 50%. Uh, and then uh, you know probably the, the 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 large well the absolute largest thing that we're working on are the projects in Montana. And we would uh, we would anticipate that we'll get the record decision next year that will allow us to go underground and do the the drilling necessary to move uh, the mine plan forward for the Montnor side of the Montnor Rock Creek. Remember, those two projects are three billion pounds of copper and a half a billion ounces of silver. They are the the third largest copper undeveloped copper asset in the U.S. 
and by far the largest uh, undeveloped silver asset, um, probably one of them in the world. Okay, one very last question. Actually, uh, you have Dolly Varden, uh, you're an inv investor in Dolly Varden as well. That's pretty much your only external, let's call it external investment. Um, are, is, is there a chance that you might in increase your investments externally or are you too focused on your internal growth right now? Um, it's certainly possible that we'll increase things. We've got people that are um, sitting at the, the uh, conference at Beaver Creek as we speak virtually. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that's certainly possible that we'll do uh, do further investments, but we don't have to. Remember, unlike many of our competitors, we've got mine lives that are measured in decades. Um, re remember, we've got the sort of cash flow generation that we have with the pipeline of projects that we've got. You know, I only mentioned the one in Montana, but we got them in Colorado, we have them in Washington, we have them in Quebec. Um, we have them at Kinskutch right next to Dolly Varden in BC. So we've got a lot of stuff uh, on the go. Um, so we don't have to do something, but we're prepared to if it makes sense. Okay, one, one very final question. Gold, silver, copper, which one is your favorite there? Uh, well, look, silver has always been uh, the mainstay of Hecla. We've produced that for 129 years. Um, we'll continue to produce it. And I think you'll see a catch up of the silver price to the gold. I um, mean, you know, if you think about it, the gold has hit its all-time high. Silver's halfway there. So it has a long way to run. And if you think about the long-term outlook for silver, um, I think you can expect it to uh, to basically increase the consumption of it by 50% over the next 20 years because it's used in so many applications. Fantastic. Phil, really appreciate you joining us this morning. Um, th thanks so much for that, for making the time. I know it's busy with Denver Gold coming up, precious metals going on. I'm sure you're, you're going to be pulled into a couple of meetings there as well. Thanks for making the time. It is much appreciated. Everybody else, thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we're here live on Twitter. This was SF Live episode number 80 with Phillips Baker. He's the president and CEO of Hecla Mining. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you turn on the alert buttons on YouTube, on Twitter. Leave some comments. Give us a thumbs up. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much.